Honorable Presidents, Prime Minister, Ministers, Members of Parliament, Leonard Mary's family, dear friends. Russia's full-scale full war of aggression against Ukraine, which, by the way, began on Estonia's Independence Day, shows that we in the collective West have made grave mistakes. The indications that Russia had set itself the goal of conquering territories and expanding its influence were there in plain sight for years. But due to our intellectual biases and extreme cautiousness, we did not want to recognize these signs. We hoped that nothing bad would happen, that somehow, maybe, we would manage. In 2014, we finally imposed sanctions. But still, we made sure not to go too far for fear of provoking Russia. Of course, only Russia is to blame for horrific war in Ukraine. But we must acknowledge that our Russia policy over the last 15 to 20 years has mostly been a shameful failure. Our efforts to engage Russia, our readiness to take its interest into account, such as decision at the NATO's Bucharest summit in 2008 not to grant Ukraine and Georgia a membership action plan, were interpreted by Russia as weakness, as an invitation to establish itself militarily in Europe. It is now our responsibility to learn lessons from these mistakes. We can say, without exaggeration, that the failure of democracy and freedom, at least in Europe, depends on how quickly and wisely we can build new policies. The theme of our conference this year is Tempus Fugit, time flees. We don't have too much time. Ukraine's heroic resistance against Russia's aggression has given us some space. Russia will not have the strength to start a new conventional war in the near future, but it will recover. During his presidency, Leonard Mary emphasized dozens of times that history has given us the states that regained or gained their independence at the end of the Gold War a short window of opportunity. Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania were able to take advantage of it. We do not even want to think about what our situation would be now had we not become members of NATO and the EU uh, in 2004. The Ukrainian people and army have opened a new window of opportunity for Europe and the West. It is not our job to change Russia, in particular if most of its people do not want this. But we do have an obligation and the power to isolate an imperialist and, aggress and aggressive Russia and to protect those of its neighbors who want to live in a free and democratic world. This will be expensive, but the price we pay today will be many times lower than tomorrow's price if we allow free reign to an aggressive Russia. For us in the Baltic states, restoring our independence and integrating into, into the West was not always easy. Even among those who are our allies today, there was hesitation, which is natural, because people are afraid of big changes, and states are even more afraid of major geopolitical changes. But not always. We are delighted with the extremely timely action of our good neighbors, Finland and Sweden. Their accession to NATO will increase not only their, their own security, but also the security of Europe as a whole and of our region in particular. I very much hope that in the coming months, the West will be de as determined as Finland and Sweden to carry out difficult but vital changes. I don't want to create delusions. There are certainly people waiting, or at least hoping, that the situation before 24th of February will be restored in some way, and that it will be possible to return to business as usual in relations with Russia. I am sure that these people are, at best, extremely cautious about the idea of Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova joining the EU or NATO. 
There is clearly no shortage of issues to discuss at this 15th Leonard, Con Leonard Mary Conference. In concluding, I would like to thank all those who have contributed to the success of the conference. Our partners in public and the private sector, our sponsors, my colleagues at the International Center for Defense and Security, and the director of the conference, Eva Ekpajuste. Thank you. And there. Okay. I think it's easier. So just however you, you want to. Sign sheet? No, just do as you like. <laughs> because I need to leave. Ladies and gentlemen, hello. Um, I'm Steve Erlanger with the New York Times, and it's a tremendous pleasure to see so many friends in the audience, so many wonderful voices, um, and in this very difficult time. We have an extremely good panel for you, but I'm very struck by the title of this conference, because time flies, it flees, it's lost. And this is what worries me. I think we're at a moment of real importance, and it's very important that we not lose the time we have, as, and that we not understand the, um, this moment, which creates all kinds of vulnerabilities, but perhaps, perhaps opportunities to rethink uh, 30 years of a kind of complacency. Uh, not just about the way we live, but the way others live and the challenges that we face. To be banal, we meet at a moment in European and transatlantic history, Russia dropping all pretense to joining what Gorbachev used to call our common European house, and violently trying to overthrow the post-Cold War order. All that's pretty clear but is much less clear, what do we want to happen? What does victory mean? What does weakening Russia mean? What does victory for Ukraine mean? We say we want Ukraine to make its own sovereign decisions about any negotiated outcome to the war, and yet we want one that is acceptable to us. So one asks oneself, is that honest? Is it fair? Is it even ethical? The West is a participant, but not a combatant in this war. It's also powerful. It's done everything but press the buttons against Russian armies and planes and generals and ships. Um, it is not yet decided, however, what outcome it wants. Um, so, these are the questions for us. What does it mean to defeat Russia? What does it mean for Ukraine to win? What should be the nature of Ukrainian sovereignty? Should it be limited? Should it be neutral? Should it be able to join NATO or even the EU? Because it's very hard to imagine Russia would allow one and not the other. And while both possibilities of membership seem far away, are they a lie? What obligations does NATO and the European Union have to a post-settlement Ukraine, to, to Moldova, let alone Georgia? So these are what's before us, and underneath all this are all the flaws and fissures that pre-existed the war. Is Trump coming back? Does Poland get a free pass? Um, lots of things to talk about. So to open this conference, I think we have quite a remarkable panel. I'm going to try to give, at the end, maybe half an hour for, for questions. So please get yourself ready for that. But we have Kaya Kalas, the Prime Minister of Estonia. We have somewhere, I hope on the screen, um, Olha Stepanishnaya, who's a Deputy Prime Minister of of the embattled state of Ukraine. We have Roberta Metzola, who's president of, of the European Parliament after the tragic death of her colleague, 
Um, unfortunately, just to warn you, Roberta has to leave about 5.45, so if she gets up, don't panic. It's fine. <laughs> it's, it's right. We've all been warned. We have Ivan Krastiev, who I think many people know, uh, who's chairman of the Center for, for, um, for Liberal Strategies and often writes op-ed pieces for us. And the well-known Dan Fried, who has done so many things in the service of the United States. Um, I met him, I think, when you were ambassador to Poland. And um, he's um, done sanctions. He's done many, many things. So it's a great panel. What I'm going to do is, 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 is ask people to say what they want to say for three or four minutes. And then um, I may ask a question. And then we will have a conversation. So. Prime Minister Kalos, over to you. Yes, thank you, and it's my great honor to be here. Uh, it's so refreshing to see so many of you here. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, the COVID seems to be gone, but, uh, but let's hope that it stays that way. Uh, but also uh, that we are having these discussions, uh, very timely discussions about those topics uh, right now. Uh, what I want to say is that uh, what we see in Ukraine, we have to understand that uh, history really matters and we have to know history. Uh, we have to teach history, but we also understand that, that um, uh, when we look at uh, Russia, um, then what uh, even if or even when the Soviet Union collapsed, the imperialistic dreams uh, of Russia never, never did. Uh, our school books, history books were rewritten to, you know, reflect the actual history of, of our region, whereas they were not rewritten in, in Russia. Uh, so it is uh, clear that uh, uh, Putin has, uh, you know, revived this uh, Stalinism. Uh, and it is interesting that 70% uh, of uh, Russian people or Russian population support uh, Stalinism. Uh, so uh, when the crimes of Nazism were widely condemned in the world, then the crimes of communism never were. And if you are here in, in Tallinn, then I really recommend you to go to visit the Armaria Mem Memorial, which is for the victims of, uh, of uh, our um, uh, Soviet past, really, which is uh, remarkable um, you know, to give the sense what we are really talking about for uh, such a small country like Estonia really is. So if you admire dictators, then there is no moral obstacle of becoming one or to uh, submitting to one. So the war uh, warning signs were there. I think we all saw those, uh, the imperial nostalgia, um, you know, the Soviet anthem uh, was never changed. So, so the Russian anthem is actually the Soviet anthem. Uh, and um, the Russian uh, victimhood or, or talking about Russians being victim, uh, also um, showing um, uh, the negativity of, of, uh, of the West. Uh, the, the West is, is uh, morally corrupt and, and uh, uh, reason for all the problems in the world. Uh, but also we saw the wars in Chechnya, and we saw uh, Crimea, we saw Georgia, Donbas, and we made the same mistake uh, every time that, okay, um, we have peace now, let it be peace, everybody stays where they are, nobody moves, and we can go on with our lives. And that was a mistake, because uh, if the aggression is not punished, uh, if the aggression is not pushed back, uh, then there will be a pause of, uh, you know, one year, two years, and everything will continue because the aggression really pays off. You get the bunch of, uh, you know, neighbor's territories. And, and this is uh, what, we, uh, what we have done. Um, so uh, also the signs in, uh, w within uh, Russia, um, the um, getting rid of potential um, opposition, um, um, this is... Uh, getting rid of the alternatives that were there, shutting down 
Memorial International that was actually dealing with the Soviet crimes. Uh, this was all the signs and preparations. So, so these were the signs um, there. And of course, we saw what happened on the 24th of February. So the question now for all of us is, have we learned from our mistakes or are we continuing uh, with, the same, uh, with the same path? Uh, so hopefully we have good discussions about this here. Thank you. That's terrific. Thank you. I'm hoping we can get um, Ola Stefanischnaya on the screen yes, uh, behind me because I'd, I'd love her to make <coughs> her contribution now. So let's hope it happens. <laughs> um, so let's give it an, another few seconds, and then if not, we will keep going and then come back to her. So uh, next then, Roberta Metzala, please. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me to this event. Uh, I speak after Kaya, who I must say has been a guiding light in our discussions on Europe's response to the invasion, but I also must say that we all owe former colleagues and colleagues like I had and Kaya with the European Parliament an apology. Because for many years, Kaya and her colleagues said, we have a problem. And we ignored it. We said, we are comfortable uh, in looking away uh, at a very unpredictable, volatile, menacing neighbor on whom we were too comfortably reliant and whose uh, leaders, autocratic, directly or indirectly, we sheltered for too long. We sold passports to them. We allow them to take over integral parts uh, of our clubs, teams, chalets. And for too long, we just said, life, don't worry, will not be different. Um, let's not talk about buying energy from each other or investing in renewable energy sources when we could continue to rely on a cheaper supply. Where are we today? Today, I think we all need to look very carefully at where the European Union has succeeded, but where it has not. I represent the European Parliament, uh, and I felt it was our responsibility as a European Parliament to say immediately upon the invasion of the 24th of February, that not only that what has happened was unacceptable, brutal, that the response had to be strong, but also that we can never go back to the world that we lived in pre-24th of February. I am part of a generation that never saw war. I come from a country that joined the European Union on the same day as Estonia did. I am married to a Finn. <laughs> Imagine that. You're going to be a NATO family, Estonia. When my son was born in 2007, my first son, my husband told me hopefully by the time he's 18, he doesn't, there will no longer be obligatory military service. Where are we now? But now is the time for us, as we did in the European Parliament, to say, yes, we are ready to send the clearest of messages that energy has always been political, that our security is dependent on anything we do to achieve our goals in transport, in environment, on migration, on being able to be more seamless and not immediately re uh, introduce borders between our member states the minute there is this virus that we think comes from outside and stops at police checks. So this is the time we have that we should use this momentum that we look, and I'm really happy to see Olga on the screen, that we look at Olga and her colleagues. When I visited Kiev on the 1st of April, I was able to address them in person and say that if we don't 
take the commitment that we are going to protect our continent because what Ukrainians are doing are fighting our war for the same fundamental values and principles and beliefs that we grew up looking to the European Union to protect, then I think we would really not only be failing our Ukrainian friends, we would not only be failing our continent, our union that we like to talk so much about, but also how are we going to look at our children and the next generations that I would say, what did you do? We already have to answer for what we did not do in 2015 right. and in 2008. I think that's something that we need to look clearly at. I want to come back to you because so far what the EU has done is spent money, which, which, which may or may not be sufficient to the actual challenge. But um, Olha, I just want to welcome you over at Dien. Thank you very much for being here. I, I hope you can hear me. Um, and um, Yes. Okay, great. Um, it is a great privilege to, to, um, to have you here. And um, you have the floor. Tell us what you want us to hear. Thank you, Your Excellency. Indeed, uh, it, it's a great privilege for me to have the opportunity to have the discussion um, uh, in such a in such a bright circle of uh, participants and decision maker which makers which is important I will not repeat some of the things many of you have heard already from us Ukrainians the Ukrainian government over your personal visits or over uh, uh, phone calls or any kind of public conversations there are just a couple of very um, important messages and parallels we now see and I want to bring it to your attention to have this discourse. Uh, so um, I absolutely have no doubt that the, uh, the outcome of this military aggression is only one possible. The new, a more strong Europe. By the end of the day, this is what we are fighting for. This is what our armed forces and soldiers and those civilians who are under occupation expecting us politicians to do. And uh, now we see that already this war has revealed uh, the new type of unity, the new type of reaction, the new type of decisions which are going beyond any procedures. Uh, these are uh, the recently uh, uh, held uh, summit of the ministers of defense in Ramstein, but also an extremely coordinated policy in terms of restrictive measures towards um, uh, Russian Federation, which has again united not only European Union member states, but also Japan, Canada, United States. Uh, the, uh, all of these efforts have been united to address the threat and to hold um, to hold Russia accountable. But uh, in that regard, I want to bring to parallel the uh, what was the outcome of the Second World War. So we all know that this has been one of the most, the bloodiest and the most brutal military aggression uh, in European continent, just uh, revealed by the ambitions of uh, uh, one paranoid uh, leader. And we now compare a lot Hitler and uh, Putin and his activity and his rhetorics. But I would like to bring to your attention what was after the Second World War, who was building what. The, the democratic countries has established the United Nations, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and European Union. And on the 9th of May, all of us has been celebrating the day of peace, of peaceful coexistence and the deliverables, the achievements we have managed to build over these 70 years to gain this peace. What was Putin and Kremlin celebrating on the 9th of May? They are still celebrating the end of the war and their victory. And this is the huge difference. And on our actions right now, it would depend in this time of war, those background, a backbone of our unity and our, um, um, our engagement and political leadership would depend on what would be the outcome of this war. And we should start planning right now because uh, only the unconditional victory of my country could be the only way out for a successful and reborn Europe. And for us, it's very important for me as, as a deputy prime minister for EU and NATO affairs. Now, when we are absolutely supportive of NATO making a decision to join 
Sweden and Finland as a member states of NATO, for us it's a very important signal showing that NATO allies has now recognized the strategic mistake which has been done back in 2008. Uh, or this, uh, the beginning of the strategic ambiguity policy and great tolerance towards Russian military engagement, which has led to three wars, two of which has been taking place in my country. Two, three wars in Europe. And uh, uh, now when we're speaking about the future and the bright future after the Ukrainian victory uh, in this fight for democracy and the values we share, uh, I think we should start planning right now what kind of unity, what kind of additional instruments we should enshrine in our democra democracy to make sure that no terror, no blackmailing and no economic blackmailing is taking place as regards our values, as regards our unity, and what else we can do to prevent this war, not for 70 years, not for 100 years, but for any possible time to make sure that our children and my children, who haven't seen me for 78 days, would recollect their memory only in uh, uh, in, in their childhood, but hopefully they will not face it as a grown-ups. So, um, uh, I think that the very important background we have managed to build to deter Russian aggression, to make sure that the isolation and the pricing is enormous for the aggressor, to make sure that Ukraine is capable to defend itself is absolutely essential to be freezed out and to be reborn in the new strategy of a stronger Europe. And of course, it is absolutely obvious for us in Ukraine that the stronger Europe is impossible without my country being over the table. We are, have now shown our nation the way it is, our people, who we are, how strong and resilient we are. And it's absolutely essential that we are working to make sure that, uh, that uh, our agenda, our resistance, our strengths, and our belief in European values is enshrined in the future of the new Europe. I mean, just I, on the 9th I, of May. May I, Matt? Yes. May I break in? Just, it just. I think that would be it. Yeah. No. No. It's fine. It's good. Um, I just wanted to ask you, while we have a good connection, um, thank you for for um, doing this. When, just two things. One, in, in your heart of hearts, what is the ultimate victory that you would like to see? That's the first question. And the second question is, what kind of institutional arrangements would you like to see, given that NATO membership is likely not going to happen or is off the table, and EU membership would take a very, very long time? Uh, yes, speaking uh, speaking uh, of uh, of the new institutional setup, it, it doesn't mean that we have to invent any other organization. It's it's it means that we should um, uh, should identify those weak places and to become a really strong European Union and strong NATO, and we should get rid of this. Um, uh, of this narrative that Russia is abuser and we should not irritate Russia. Uh, we have nothing to be afraid of. We already have the war on our territory and we are ready to stay strong and to hold Russia accountable. Uh, so that's, uh, that means that the unconditional victory of Ukraine is uh, the, the victory which will allow us to prevent these wars and to make sure that we give the clear answer to Russia that no war can happen uh, from Russian Federation on any territory, whether it's Ukraine or any other territory. And no other state can grow up a dictator who will just wake up in the morning and announce a special operation or a war. And this is not uh, cannot be done only by Ukrainian military resistance. The, the broader political leadership and political s common sense should prevail. And we think that the first decision in that regard could be uh, taking place already in June, where despite the threats of Russian Federation, the U EU leaders can make a decision and grant Ukraine a candidate status, which would bring the whole discourse on enlargement and the new future of Europe to the agenda. Wow. And speaking about the, uh, the other institutional uh, element, NATO uh, is uh, not uh, on a table for Ukraine at this stage, I'm sure, but as part of the negotiation process, we have called on the leaders of the Security Council of um, 
UN and the G7 to uh, sign the agreement on the broader security guarantees, which should be a new format of security support of a country and stabilization of, uh, or, of the region. Right. So this should be the new beginning, but also the Ramstein meeting has been a new beginning we should build on. Great. Thank you very, very much. And I hope you can keep connected so um, we can come back to you with, yes. um, with some questions now. I'd like to turn to Ivan Krastyev, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, for me, and because uh, I'm not a politician, uh, obviously a certain period that started with the peaceful unification of Germany ended with the Russians attempt violently, violently to partition Ukraine. And the first question is the one that Kai asked, what we got wrong out of the last 30 years. And in my view, one of the things that we got wrong was that when basically Soviet Union opened and showed an interest in liberal order and was signing all these documents and so on, it was the Soviet Union who did it. It was never Russia. And one of the reasons President Gorbachev did it, he believes that this is the way to preserve the Soviet Union. People have forgotten that most of these documents, including with the Paris Charter, was signed when the Soviet Union was there. And what basically President Gorbachev liked about European Union was a very strong anti-nationalist moment. And because he was fighting the republics, this is what he was going there. And then you have a totally different actor, uh, and this was Russia, and this was, Russia was not post-imperial. So this is the story, because in its history, Russia, Russia was nothing else but empire. Uh, in uh, year 2000, uh, opinion poll shows that the majority of the Russians didn't know when is their national day. Back then it was the day of the Russian constitution. 57% believe that the current uh, borders of Russia are not going to remain for a long time. Some wanted to expand, some feared that basically Russia is going to lose territory. And the idea of the Russian identity was not there. So in a certain way, you have this identity building projects that ended where it ended. And in my view, this is quite important because when we are saying that this is changing European Union fundamentally, and I very much agree with this, the problem was that we, it's not so easy for the European Union to change than we pretend for three reasons. The idea that security is based on economic interdependence is what European Union was about. It was not just kind of the business dream of several German leaders. This is what European Union was preaching to everybody. It was European Union who believes that military power doesn't matter. And basically, we have been looking at the Americans that they basically tr like to fight. And we believe this is about soft power. It is not so much about soft power also. So in a certain way, it's a much more dramatic and radical change within Europe. And in my view, there are three things that at least probably we should keep in mind. One is that now when much more decolonization than the Cold War is what is shaping what we see, because it's a classical colonization war. Basically, Russia tried to recolonize Ukraine. Keep in mind that European Union was founded by former empires. Failing or failed, but this was all of them. It was only with the enlargement of the East that massively post-imperial nation states entered the European projects. It's a different sensibility about many issues, understanding of sovereignty and others. My colleague Tim Snyder, in my view, was very strong making particularly this uh, uh, argument. Secondly, what is the difference between soft power and resilience? Soft power is basically weaponizing the attraction of your system. Resilience, and here we have Dan Fried who knows about sanctions probably than <laughs> anybody in the world. The strength of the sanctions is not what you can do to Russia. It is to show to the Russians that you are not afraid of the price that you are going to pay for it. In a certain way, resilience is about the pain that you are ready to endure. And this is not easy in a democratic countries. And I'm going to end up on my last point. Uh, why we reacted so differently in 2015 and then 2020, and the major reason was the Ukrainians. This is, in my view, be very, in my view, not particularly kind of a nice to say, but if Ukrainians were not fighting back in the way they fought back, if it was just a repetition of Crimea of 2015, I don't believe that the Western reaction was going to be so different than it was in 2015. It was basically what the Ukrainians did. Strangely, all this European society that a kind of a post-sacrifice society 
was so much impressed by the readiness of the people to die for their independence. But how are you going to rearrange the European Union, which was based on the idea of post-war? The war is not possible anymore, mm -hmm. and we are coming out of this experience into a kind of a new union. In my view, this is not so obvious. So even when we talk about our unity, it is easy to be united in the first two or three months when public opinion is morally outraged by what it is seeing. But I want to see what is going to happen in three, four months when the party of peace saying that the most important is for the war to end, regardless of what concessions Ukrainians has to do, and the party of justice saying that there cannot be peace if the Ukrainian territories are going to remain occupied, mm -hmm. when they're going to clash in every single party and when they go on elections. Yes. So from this point of view, I do believe it's quite important to try to understand that the most difficult things in Ukraine already happened, but the most difficult things in Europe are coming. Yes, well, I think that's precisely <coughs> right. And particularly when you consider inflation, which you said is at 19% here, um, rise of energy prices, this will have political backlash. It, it simply has to. I mean, there's some no way. Dan, with your forgiveness, I want to ask Roberta something before she has to go. Um, you had said um, in your um, moving remarks that the European Union had learned from its mistakes, it had done some good things, but it had made some mistakes. And I just wanted to ask you what occurred to you as the most important mistake and the most important good thing that, um, that Brussels and its member states have done. I think uh, I'll start with the most important is that the unity and the coordinated response not only through to the actions and help uh, to Ukraine from a financial, logistical, arms perspective, but also in the tangible solidarity of opening up of homes and schools and countries to almost six million Ukrainian um, uh, mothers and children that you, you see every day in classes, in societies, they're waiting for the possibility to go back home. But while they're waiting, we revise laws that we ignored for 20 years, even though we could have used them in different areas, different crises, different influxes. Uh, but we did that now because we saw that there was our responsibility to do it. Uh, and if someone had asked me three months ago whether that particular piece of legislation could ever be triggered, I said we tried multiple times and we didn't manage. Yeah. Uh, well, in it terms of helped that they were white and Christian for the most part. It, I think, what we could argue about is, uh, yeah, it, it's it's difficult because no, the, the question will come when, when a similar point or question will be asked by the southern member states when they are potentially mm -hmm. um, uh, faced with the, with a migratory influx. But that's that's the f that's let's say we are talking about flee f a flee flee uh, millions fleeing war. In terms of uh, where we have failed, I think it's simply when we refused or used legal obstacles. Now I'm a lawyer and I, have I did this for years. You use legal obstacles in order to hide the fact that you have no political will to do something. And there, you know, as, a, as an elected politician myself, I can no longer go to my next election in 2024 and say, do you know what, the reason why uh, we didn't do this is because we really can't or the governments are blocking or that particular institution did not do enough. If our citizens say, we want you to move on climate change, we want you to move on making sure that the European Union enlarges, that there is uh, a security consideration, a political consideration to look beyond um, the countries uh, that are current members, but those that look to Europe as their home. And it, we have to have the leadership and the vision to see the European Union as being able to have that conversation. Yes. We did not have it before. Right. Uh, we might, though the next few weeks, as Ivan said, will be crucial in that regard. But we have the opportunity to look back at the past two years, let's say a very crisis-ridden Europe with a pandemic, but now with a war on its territory to say, where do we want to go? And do we manage to address what our citizens 
also different to previous situations. Before you'd have leaders that take the decision, go back home and try to explain it. But now it's our people saying, you know what, we want you to do this. Yeah. And we need to be ready to answer Great. that. Great. Thank you. No, because I mean, one of the things that's most striking to me about Ukraine, I mean, the Americans knew Russia would invade, but thought Ukraine would collapse very quickly. Um, and, and, uh, and as um, Yvonne said, that was the big Miscalculation. Yeah. Misapprehension, but also now perceived as an opportunity. And Zelensky, too, I think surprised himself, let alone everyone else, um, when you compare him roaming around the streets in his green T-shirt to Putin sitting at that grotesque 20-foot white table, you have images of democracy and authoritarianism. So I'm hoping European leaders will seize the moment too. They haven't yet, but um, maybe they will. So feel free to go when you need, and um, thank you very, very much. Thank you. Okay, and Dan, over to you. Prime Minister, you were right. We were slow to understand the danger, but not too late. We understood it slowly, but we were not too late. My own government understood that Putin was going to invade and they understood it early. And I, I'm looking at you, Avril Haines, right? They were spot on right. They did well. <laughs> Unfortunately, they were right about Putin's intentions, but fortunately, they were wrong about what would happen on the battlefield. They got that, they blew that call. Well, everybody did. I'm not sure Except whether- Russians. <laughs> Russians knew Ukrainians would fight. They just didn't believe Putin would do it. <laughs> Not sure. <laughs> Maybe. Not sure about that. We've done, the West has done pretty well. We've exceeded some of our own skeptical expectations. Sanctions, military assistance, the United States Britain, other allies, Estonia, are running a major logis military logistics operation out of Poland and at a wartime basis. That's pretty serious, and I'm looking at you, Celeste Wallander. Like, well done. Like, seriously, this is good stuff. The Ukrainians have done magnificently. Now think about it. Russia attacks Ukraine, and we don't know whether Russia will prevail. Who would have thought that three months ago? Who would have written that three months ago? We don't know whether Russia can prevail on the battlefield. They might, they might, but they might not. And in that possibility lies our responsibility right now. We have responsibility commensurate with the possibility of Ukrainian success on the battlefield. And it's a battle worth fighting. Ukrainian National identity has crystallized in a democratic rather than nationalist form. All right. Jamala winning the Eurovision contest, a Crimean Tartar, and embraced as a Ukrainian national hero. That's, that is important. Now, we have, Ivan Krastev is right. We're going to face some very difficult choices. Okay. We're watching Hungary, it appears, block EU consensus on the next big sanction coming down the road, which is oil, you know, an oil embargo phased in over time. I hope that it's not true what Erdogan said today about blocking Finnish and Swedish NATO membership, and God knows what he'll do about security guarantees for Ukraine. There is going to be a temptation to deal, the party of peace, right, as Ivan Krastev said to deal meaning to tell the Ukrainians what territory they have to give up before it's been won on the battlefield by the Russians who may not win it at all. I'm an old policy person, an old bureaucrat. I used to get paid for figuring out ways to get around insurmountable obstacles. That's the job of the governments of the West, to figure out what we do to get around the insurmountable, supposedly insurmountable obstacles that we may face. That's, that used to be my job. Now it's like your job, colleagues. colleagues. 
That's what we need to do. Not to start negotiating among ourselves about the definition of victory, which always means, I hate that conversation, because it always ends up somebody comfortable telling the Ukrainians what they have to surrender. As Solzhenitsyn wrote, how does a man, how does somebody warm understand somebody cold? We're warm. The Ukrainians are less so. I don't want to have a, a theoretical discussion about territories they have to surrender for peace. I want to have a discussion about, about what we do right now to move the needle in the right direction. More military supplies, more sanctions, and if, if Viktor Orban is blocking it, there are lots of ways to work around that. National efforts, the dreaded American secondary sanctions, I mean, awful stuff, and, and the European Union is happy to complain. We have options. Last thought, again, our responsibilities to help Ukraine are commensurate with the stakes and the strength of Ukrainian democracy that we see every day. So it is great to be here. Leonard Mary would tell us, keep fighting, never give in. Thank you. It's not spoken like a, a bureaucrat, Dan, I have to say. An ex-bureaucrat. <laughs> they don't pay me to be you nice know, anymore. You free now, yes. <laughs> no. um, I fear we've lost Ola. There was, sounded like there was some kind of air raid siren, and I didn't want to interrupt. Um, so if she can come back, that would be wonderful, and if she cannot, I think she heard real warm words of support here. Kai, you wanted to say? To yeah, I, I wanted to comment on a few things what uh, uh, Ivan said. Um, uh, you know, I had many discussions with uh, EU colleagues regarding Ukraine, and, and very interesting ones. And, and um, uh, one discussion that I had in, in France, uh, <laughs> Uh, just driving to that location uh, in Paris, I, I, I realized what you say, the imperialistic uh, states of European Union, uh, the uh, uh, member I said states. former empires. Yeah, uh, former empires, uh, former empires. But, but this is a valid point because if you drive around in Paris, and I was driving to this meeting and seeing all these monuments uh, dedicated dedicated to Napoleon. So I, I suddenly realized that, you know, uh, war for us, uh, small countries like us, means total devastation, means destruction, means atrocities, human suffering. It's black and white. It's very bad thing. Whereas for some countries, you know, war might mean, you know, you are strong, you're pow powerful, you get uh, more uh, territories. So, so the, the historical background is, is different. It's, it's not that black and white, uh, uh, um, unfortunately. And uh, of course, when we, when we had Crimea, then Crimea was different in, in, uh, in many ways. Why now it is easier to keep the unity because in Crimea, uh, you know, Putin was saying that I'm not doing this and we were saying that you're doing this, uh, but uh, there were people uh, doubting and, and what they played then very well was to play us against each other. And I was a member of European Parliament at the time together with uh, Roberta and I saw these discussions going on in the European Parliament where you have the representatives directly elected from different member states. And and, and we talked about sanctions, and you saw, you know, is there a really, you know, is there a really a war? Is it, I mean, is it really Russia that is doing all this? And you saw this confusion that is really easy to create in the public opinion of the European countries. And uh, this is different this time, and, and I think we have um, made huge efforts to keep this unity and also to keep the public opinion uh, on our side. Um, so... Um, and uh, my final point regarding uh, the peace agreements, then uh, I also see this, uh, you know, as you say, uh, the party of peace, um, who say that 
the peace is the ultimate goal. If we get peace, we forget everything else. Then, uh, you know, our ultimate goal is to have peace. But if it is the ultimate goal and you forget about everything that has been done, then there will be a pause of one year, two years, and everything will continue in a much uh, broader scale because aggression pays off and it can't just pay off. So, so uh, okay. we we have to understand, I stop uh, stop here, okay. uh, we have to understand that um, we have to constantly remind this, that we can't pressure Ukraine into any kind of peace agreements, what they are not um, you know, prepared to go into. And we also have to zoom out of the picture. It's not like Ukraine invited Russia to the table and asked that, okay, what territories you wanna, wanna get and, and who you wanna kill? It's because, you know, uh, Russia invaded Ukraine and tries mm -hmm. to take its independence. Yes, good. And, and we also have to be careful to let the Ukrainians decide what they're willing to sacrifice for peace also. I mean, that's part of the question that I, uh, that I have. I was just in Sweden, which is having a psychodrama about joining, about joining NATO. Um, it's... It's going to happen, but it's painful, I would say. But one of the things people have realized there, this isn't Crimea, this isn't little green men, these are tanks and missiles mm. and guns. It's exactly. a whole different thing that's happened now. And um, it scares everyone to death, it really does, because if they can do it to a supposedly brotherly country where they're all the same people, if you believe Putin, then it's easier to imagine at least a future Russia doing it elsewhere. But that's part of the question I wanted to ask, because it just seems to me, you know, we talk about European unity, but um, we hope it persists. But already you have in France, in Germany too, in other countries, a notion, well, let's keep talking to Putin. We have to keep lines out to Putin. This will end at some point. Russia won't go away. They're our neighbor. Uh, we can't pretend Putin's going to disappear, right? Now, it's not produced anything yet, but I wonder how it looks to other parts of Europe, let alone to the United States. Um, and I wonder if any of you wanted to comment on this problem. I can. So l let's give you the Bulgarian perspective, which is very particular. <laughs> you don't want to be a prime minister of Bulgaria today. Uh, we did some focus groups, and here is what comes. I'm going to give you the profile of somebody who has been always voting for democratic pro-Western parties, and basically the colleagues, he's a uh, owner of a small hotel on the Bulgarian Black Sea coast. The person hosted the uh, uh, Ukrainian family give them jobs and really cares about them. So this same person believes the following things. First, he had a huge sympathy for the Ukrainians and believes that they are victims. Secondly, he believes that Putin is a criminal. Thirdly, he believes that it was NATO who should be blamed for the war starting. Fourthly, he believes that Putin is going to win at the end. Fifthly, he believes basically that Bulgaria should not give arms because we don't want to be involved. Sixthly, he believes that he does not like particularly the president who is uh, saying that we should not give arms because there is something kind of immoral in this. Uh, uh, so, but no, but listen, this is very important. We start with the idea that people has a consistent view of what is going on and that basically this is going to be at the center of their attention all the time. And the biggest question with like every war is for whom the time works. Mm -hmm. And for me, this is the biggest question, which is for the European Union, because this is not one political space. Uh, listen, President Putin did something that none of his predecessors has done. Lenin, Stalin, they mummified themselves and put themselves in the mausoleum. Putin decided to mummify Russia. <laughs> the country is close and so on. But of course Russia is going to stay. You cannot treat it like Serbia because it's a nuclear power, and this is a reality. And then suddenly, when you start to go for energy diversification, you understand that you start to depend also on countries that you don't like much. Mm. So from this point of view, how you're going to have effective policy in a five or ten years is critical. And one is where I very much agree with Dan is what is happening on the ground. 
Because the biggest crisis of the Russian legitimacy is not simply that they invaded, the problem is that they are not winning. And I do believe this is one of the major questions that Russians are asking their president, why it's not Crimea anymore. Because people normally like war when war is on television and when they're winning. But when you basically start paying for this, and secondly, for our societies, uh, then you try to understand that it's going to be also very asymmetrical, the impacts. Yeah. Very asymmetrical. And from this point of view, you should renegotiate in a totally different way. This is not like renegotiating agricultural policies. You should try to convince people that Europe is a community of faith, that what is happening in one country goes with another country. Even I don't believe that we have the language to talk about this. A and this is why I'm afraid of two things. And uh, I, I want to, uh, first, we claim that basically Russia is totally isolated. This is only partially true. Russia is isolated in the West and our major allies. Paradoxically, some of, by the way, the majority of the countries that President Biden invited for the summit of democracy are not sanctioning. That's right. uh, and also for me, it was a shock to see to what extent countries like India or South Africa that have a such strong colonial history cannot identify with a country that basically is facing a colonial war. But exactly because in their historical imagination, we were the colonizers. Mm -hmm. So if we're not trying to get out of this and try to make this war important not only for Europe, but for others, in three, four, five years, President Putin is not going to do well for many reasons, economic right. and others. But then we should try to treat Russia as a big Chernobyl. You're isolating, you're trying basically not to allow anything to happen, but it also cannot stay forever because there are many things happening. And this is why, in my view, having a long-term strategy for the EU, for Ukraine, for basically, can we imagine that another Russia is possible? This is the conversation that we don't have in the moment. That's right. Stan, please. So two points, one tactical, one strategic. Tactically, every time I come to Estonia or Poland, people tell me that the West Europeans have this fatuous optimism about uh, about whoever's in the Kremlin. And they roll their eyes and they say, usually with justice, we told them so they never listen. I get that. But as an American, if I were an American official, would I use my political capital to try to convince the French and the Germans not to talk to Putin? Nah, I probably wouldn't. Go ahead, knock yourselves out. I'd save my political capital for the actual results. Talk to him, but sanctions. Talk to him, but military equipment. You know, put my faith in Vladimir Putin not to have a productive dialogue whatsoever. Which leads to the, that's my tactical point. The strategic point is to be in violent agreement with Ivan Krustov. There is a view held in Estonia for good and strong historical reasons that Putin is the natural apotheosis of Russian history. That, like, it's not going to get better because he represents their worst tradition and they always live down to it. Maybe, and it's not for any American to say that the Estonians are wrong or the Poles. But look, I remember, I'm old enough to remember in the, the early 1970s in Moscow when the, the street talk was, after Brezhnev, it'll be worse, so you better deal with him. Well, after Brezhnev, there was Gorbachev. After Stalin, there was Khrushchev. No, no angel, but compared to Yosef Vissarionovich, huh? Discontinuity has actually been the rule in Russian history for the last 35 years. Discontinuity. Gorbachev after Brezhnev, Yeltsin after Gorbachev. I'm not saying that after Putin it will be better. I'm just saying that if there is a defeat, and I'm kind of finishing Ivan Krastev's sentence, if the Russians lose, then the last 200 years of Russian history suggests that after a losing war, there can be domestic turbulence and even sometimes reform. Now, regime change is not our policy, and it shouldn't be our policy. It is, and I'm going to whisper this part, it's a bonus. <laughs> when, everything else, when you get everything else right, like the fall of the Soviet Union was not our policy, but hey, I'll, I'll live with it. We should take seriously the possibility of change in Russia. And this is not to argue with 
the U.S. intelligence community's apparent assessment you know, of current nasty trends. But there are better trends that are possible. History suggests that we ought to keep that in mind. I mean, Vladimir Karamurza, right? Isn't he a Russian? He believes in the po potential of a better future for Russia. So, you know, when we talk to the French and the Germans, I always like to steer them in the direction of don't be too eager to deal with Putin now. Remember that there is the poss if you want to be optimistic, there's the possibility of a better Russia. Very good. It is, to be fair, worth saying that both the French and the Germans are backing sanctions. Sure. Are providing weapons and Absolutely. are very much on the side of yeah. Ukraine. Oh, so I'm not going to hit I know, the Germans. I'm, I, I, I'm just, you know. At all. Fine. I mean, we I, I think all. The change has been quite re has been quite remarkable. But when right. we say, you know, this is the question we we started out with. If Russia is defeated, I, I'm not sure I know what that means, frankly. Mm -hmm. But we that's a discussion, as you said, you don't want to have. Mm. Kaya, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I understand your point uh, that uh, you know uh, you know talk to him and nothing uh, I mean do the right things at the same time but uh, but I I, I mean m to me it's the question why <laughs> talk to him I mean why he's a war criminal I mean uh, I'm a, I'm a lawyer by profession and I I looked up uh, the definition of war crimes and uh, genocide for that matter and it is the willingness to get rid of. Uh, you know, uh, part of the uh, nation or or, uh, or a whole nation, and and he has expressed this will, his intention. Uh, he has done steps for this, he, and and he's a war criminal. And and uh, and uh, if you say that uh, you know there is no outcome of talking to him, then why? talk to him uh, because uh, I feel I don't see into his head of course and and uh, into Gremlin's walls but but I feel that if everybody is constantly calling him he doesn't get the message that he's isolated uh, so uh, so if we want to get him the message through that uh, that actually you are isolated don't call him mm -hmm. uh, no point and and what what is uh, interesting um, what you uh, what you say uh, the change in Russia and and I agree with you uh, that it could be possible but it has to start from uh, condemning widely the crimes sure. uh, made in Ukraine but also the communistic crimes that have never been condemned widely because right. they were considered the I mean winners of the war but the the atrocity started from the 10th of May for us so if Olena said uh, Olha said uh, that um, uh, that uh, celebrate the victory day but uh, for us I mean uh, if Stalin would have said on the 10th of May that go on be a free country do whatever you like and go on back uh, to mining your own business uh, then we could also celebrate the day of peace and everything but but the atrocity started for our country and it's the same for Ukraine right now if we don't widely condemn this and also get the message through to Russia uh, then it will just continue because the imperialistic dreams will never be killed in that sense okay great we we have <laughs> well done we have about 25 minutes left. I promised to give the floor to people here. The only thing I would beg you, please, some of you are well known, but please identify yourself anyway. And please ask a question and don't make a speech because I don't want to have to be rude. So <laughs> former President Ilvis, you first. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Okay, thank you. I'm going to ask a question, uh, take advantage of the fact that we have such an outstanding panel to ask a question of you all, which is that uh, basically, right, we're, we don't need to waste our political capital telling uh, France and Germany we told you so. But I have a different question, is that given how badly the past 20 years have gone under the leadership of uh, Western countries that refuse to believe what we were saying, don't you think it's perhaps time to see for once, 25 years, 23 years after the enlargement of NATO to include East Europeans, that perhaps 
we can see a reordering of future foreign policy, both in NATO, but also with the high representative in, uh, in the European Union, to that would actually deal with the serious security problems that we deal with, as opposed to wishful thinking and um, well, there's now even a, uh, a Russian verb call, uh, coined by Solovyov the other day, Makronit, which is to constantly call Putin. Um, uh, so maybe that's what I would like to hear from the three Good. of you. Good. What I'd like to do is take two more questions, if I can. This lady here, if I may, who's got glasses and her hand up. And that lady there also with glasses and her hand up. <laughs> Thank you, go ahead. Thank you so much to the um, panel. Um, Thank you so much for the panel. It was um, a great session. Uh, my name is Rebecca eastwood Caskell. I'm the political advisor at NATO Special Operations Headquarters. Um, my question is, the, if the goal, I it was said multiple times about the goal of what's happening in Ukraine is peace, but I have assumed that it was something greater. I assumed that it was solidifying the foundations of the international rules-based order, not just peace for Ukraine, but something bigger. If that is true, yet the speaker said that resilience is very difficult to build in democracies, what is it that we must do today to ensure our foundations don't crack before Ukraine does win the peace? Thank you. Thank you. And then last question in this round. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I'm Alina Polyakova. I'm president and CEO of the Center for European Policy Analysis in Washington. Uh, great to see you. And uh, President Ilvez, you took my line. Um, so shame on you for that. But I actually did have a question for all of you. And this goes back to the debate uh, that Eva, Ivan brought up and that you, Madam Prime Minister, spoke to about uh, the, the so-called party of peace and the party of justice and the kinds of uh, divisions we're likely to see and already seeing emerge in our societies about how this war ends. Um, and I'd like you to hear a response to what I sometimes hear in Washington, which is that at the end of the day, all wars end in negotiations. And most likely what we're going to see is Russia keep some of the territories that it is currently occupying and is trying to annex, like Kherson and others. Um, and this is just the reality we have to live with and just accept. And I think the reason why this seems like a peaceful outcome is because one, there are two images that come to people's minds. There's the frozen conflict image, that you know, this can just go on forever as a frozen conflict and the rest of rump Ukraine can move on. Or the image I think of West and East Germany, where we had a divided country in the middle of Europe, uh, but we managed it for quite some time and look, it led to a reunification eventually. Um, I'm of the mind that these are not the outcomes we would have uh, for several reasons, Me, one being that the Kremlin will not rebuild the, D, the, uh, the Donbass like uh, the Soviet Union rebuilt the DDR. Uh, but I'd love to hear responses to if this is the future we're all looking at, uh, what does that say to you about the stability and security for Europe? Great, thank you. Um, who would want to start? Do you want to? No, let's kaya. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, uh, the uh, Eastern Europeans um, uh, or uh, all those countries who have uh, really uh, joined European Union and uh, um, and NATO, um, I think um, what this war has brought is that we are being more listened to, which is something new uh, uh, for, for, uh, for our experience, I would say. And, and uh, definitely, uh, I, I feel that we are stronger voices uh, now and we should be also taken as equals uh, um, in, in the future as well, I hope at least. Uh, what I was saying um, about, uh, I was saying that peace can't be the ultimate goal because uh, the ultimate goal is that the rules-based order, uh, the freedom, all the things that we, uh, the values that we have agreed. But uh, what was there the point that uh, there is, a, you know, the party of peace who says the peace is the ultimate goal and is the party of justice, which says that, that actually we have the, you know, rule of law and, and all these things, international uh, 
um, uh, order uh, that is also at stake here. And why I'm saying this is that if we uh, let this aggression pay off by saying that, okay, now there's peace, everybody's uh, uh, happy, uh, then um, this will just continue because, uh, you know, aggression pays off, you are not punished for what you did. And that's why we definitely have to prosecute the crimes, uh, the war crimes that we are seeing in Ukraine right now and, and punish uh, the war criminals so that aggression would not uh, pay off. Okay. Dan, did you want to yeah. respond? <coughs> of course, the voices from the Eastern tier of Europe need to have more weight in Central European institution, in Central all European institutions, and President, we've talked about this for many years. You were right, I always agreed with you, didn't always make me popular in Washington, but that's okay. Secondly, of course, peace is not the objective. You can always surrender. Third, there's a real, this is Alina Polyakova's question, and unusually she didn't even put it strong enough in my view. There's a moral hazard asking Ukraine to surrender territory because everybody in this room, I suspect, knows what happens to the people in the territory that surrendered. You're not surrendering it, mm. to even to Brezhnev Soviet Union, you're surrendering it to Stalin. Yeah, and your response, you wanna be responsible for the consequences, because everybody knows what they're gonna be. Mm. We're seeing it, mass deportations, mass killings, filtration camps, you know, Right? Pressing down the culture. The whole thing, the whole, the whole package, yes, yes, the whole package. Um, read about the occupation, you know, read Ann Applebaum, Tim Snyder, ask any Estonian. Read okay. the journalists <laughs> who are on the ground. Yeah, well, not, not your any New York message. Times, not your New not York Times predecessor in Moscow. Sorry? Not your New York Times predecessor in Moscow from the 1930s. Well, uh, yeah, well. Okay. Um, that was 90 years ago. I know, but <laughs> forgotten, remembered in this part of the world. Look, <laughs> remembered the, in this part of the world too, by the, the way. <laughs> yes, it is possible that at the end of the day, a f winter war solution will be inevitable. That's possible. The Finns look at the winter war as a strategic success. They're proud of what their grandfathers did and they're right to be proud but it's not up to us to tell the Ukrainians. I don't want, uh, boy, if I were in government, I would not want to commission an interagency study of proper outcomes, and because it would leak, and then where would you be? I don't want to have that, I, I'm an old bureaucrat, I don't want to have that discussion of what Ukraine should surrender. Push the needle, you know, extend, extend the timeline, push the needle to the right, and then we'll know when and if it comes time to have that conversation and the Ukrainians will know it before we do. That time is not now, and I don't want to have that conversation, least of all between the Americans and the West Europeans about somebody else. Good, thank you. Uh, Go on. I'll start with President Ilvesen. First of all, we should also not try to make ourselves better than we are. There was twist in Europe. Some of the most pro-Russian governments in Europe are also East European governments. So when we're talking about Eastern Europe, there was the Baltic countries, there was Poland, there was others. Okay. So from this point of view, this is also in my view important because where I agree totally with you, certain things ended with this war and this is basically the idea that the West can lecture the East about certain things. I don't believe that what we should do is now start lecturing the West. I'll be much more, to be honest, happy if the Polish government is going to talk to the Hungarian government than basically readjusting and talking what they have in mind about uh, President Steinmeier or Chancellor Merkel. Because the biggest problem with Eastern Europe is we were right that this idea that trade is going to solve all security problems of Europe was false. Certain West European countries universalized their experience and this is normal, but it was a risky exercise, and you can see it. On the other side, in order for East Europeans to get the leadership that you're asking for, and I do believe this is fair, we should show that we can be also effective and interested in things which are not Russia. Mm -hmm. Mediterranean, mm -hmm. Africa, China. if you want to, China, if you want to really 
lead Europe, it cannot be only about Russia, because also mm -hmm. keep in mind, in order to deal with Russia now, you should create a partnerships, particularly economically, in a places that we have never been interested before. Yeah. Uh, and then it goes very much to the, uh, uh, to the other two questions, where resilience starts. To be absolutely honest, I do believe resilience starts with knowing your own society. Because the m biggest problem is how to sustain a situation which is going to be quite difficult over a longer period of time. You remember the story of this uh, Roman uh, uh, leader who basically put his, uh, uh, his hand into the fire just to try to show the invading army that basically he's not going to blink and they're going to fight till the end. Capacity to endure pain, I mean economic pain, is what is going to change policies. And here comes uh, the story which Alina is asking. For me, strangely enough, NATO's enlargement towards Sweden and Finland is a good opening if you want to discuss international order. Because basically, I don't believe that you can move to the Russia side and starting discussing international order when they basically have their troops in the country and basically you're talking about a ceasefire which probably is not going to be peace. But if Russia is really so much afraid of basically Finland and Sweden getting up, let's talk about international order. What really they do believe? What is about the sovereignty of their neighboring countries? It's not only Ukraine. We're talking Georgia, we're talking Moldova, we're talking about everything. Because the basic assumptions of the Russian foreign policy was that in 1990s, it's not that they were promised NATO not to enlarge, but they promised the sphere of influence in the post-Soviet space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, look at 1990s and you're going to see that all peacekeepers in all conflicts in the post-Soviet space were Russian troops. So this kind of a story that they get certain things and now we are taking it from them, this is things to be discussed seriously. Uh, and in my view, this is going to be a very difficult conversation, particularly with somebody who is losing a war, who has an apocalyptic mind, and who believes that uh, there was a, a, great, uh, a great argument being done, a colleague, in a previous session, saying that many people, not only in the Russian leadership, believe that if Russia cannot basically survive, there is no reason for the world to survive. Uh, so, uh, yeah, 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 but this is, yeah. and in my view, this is a very serious conversation. But first, we should show in our own societies that even if the governments are going to change, this is not going to change policy. Even basically, if they're going to be economic costs, we are ready to sustain them. Even if there are going to be changes in the American presidency, it does not mean a totally different policy with respect to Europe. And listen, if you're Putin, if you don't know all answers to all these questions, you believe that probably hope rhymes with history. He believes that the change in one country, the veto of another country, the change in the United States can change everything. So from this point of view, I do believe unless you're going to basically defeat his expectations that the West is going to change, yeah. Ukraine is going to be in a difficult position because one of the major preconditions of this invasion was that Russian leadership believes that the West is in decline. Yeah. This is an irreversible, particularly cultural decline. Morally corrupt. Um, can we get the microphone up here, if that's possible? Um, first to another former president, please. This is a nice, short and easy one, and it's to Prime Minister Kallas. Um, uh, Putin has managed to enlarge NATO again, but I don't feel he's quite there yet with the European Union. Uh, what is the latest gossip in Brussels considering the conflicting messages of Ursula von der Leyen who made all Ukrainians believe that they are or will be invited to start discussions joining European Union and then some other people who have been saying that we are going to seek intermediate uh, and, uh, and different solutions than full membership. Thank you. Okay, and then could you give, I actually just give it, Right next door to Camille. Um, uh, Camille Grand, Assistant Secretary Camille. General at NATO. Just uh, my, my question is the, is the following. We, listening to you, it's, it's very obvious that uh, Russia or Putin has achieved a, what will probably be remain as a massive strategic blunder, you know, in the, a good chapter in the histories of the best, biggest mistakes in foreign and, and defense policy by underestimating Ukraine, by overestimating his own forces, by underestimating Western unity and NATO reaction, uh, by uh, generating unintended consequences such, such as the move of, of Finland and Sweden. So, so, so the list goes on and on. 
But my question, which is a bit of a follow-up to the discussion, which I, I don't really agree with on opposing the party of peace to the party of justice, I think there is a poor peace and, and, and a good peace. Uh, there is a just peace, as there are maybe... Yet, uh, so, so I think that there we... There, 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 but I'll leave that one aside, because my real question is, how can we transform that Russian strategic failure, which is already apparent, in a genuine victory for Ukraine and for uh, uh, all liberal values and the political West? Great. Great. Um, could, could we then... I just want to get two more questions in. I promise Mr. Kramer and Mr. Lucas. <coughs> and then we'll go back to the panel, and then we can all talk over dinner. Go ahead. Uh, David Kramer uh, with the George W. Bush Institute in Dallas, Texas. Uh, I think, Steve, it was you who said NATO is off the table for Ukraine, and my question to the panel is why? Uh, why can't we actually get behind a scenario where Ukraine emerges victorious, defeats Putin, possibly delivers him a fatal blow, and in that scenario, wouldn't NATO be lucky to have Ukraine? Okay, very good question. And Ed, you've got the last question. Edward Lucas, um, also from SEPA. Um, I just want to push back a bit against um, Ivan's idea that it's you know, it's, there's no point in saying hope and history rhyme. It seems to me, which is the poem on the front of the um, agenda booklet, and I hope you've all read it, um, the, it seems to me that President Zelensky has become the leader of the free world um, in moral terms. He's re-established a heroic narrative that we last saw probably articulated by Václav Havel some 30 years ago. Um, and that is a potential game changer. And I think it's also wrong to say that Eastern Europe is only worried about Russia. Um, we've seen, I think the Czech foreign minister is here, the Czechs have pioneered a new approach to Taiwan. Um, the Lithuanians have picked that ball up and run very bravely with it. And it seems to me that, the, that you, can, you could make that criticism maybe in the 90s and the noughties. Um, but it seems odd to, that some people criticize the East Europeans for being overly ambitious and having thoughts about China and then say, but they're only focused on Russia. It can't be okay. both. Great. Um, now, we have about seven minutes. So what I'd like to do is go back to the panel, take a couple of minutes and say whatever, whatever answer you want to say, because that's how these things end, you know, in a ceasefire. So, um, Kaya, why don't you yeah, go first? Okay. Uh, well, uh, first, the candidate uh, status for Ukraine. Um, of course, can't give you all the gossip here just between us, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, but um, we are working on this, and we still have some... Uh, well, we have countries who have very strong opinions against. Uh, uh, but it is interesting that the Europe Barometer study came out and the public opinion of those countries actually was not reflecting uh, the, the opinion of their leaders. So I'm wondering whether this public opinion really changes the mind of the leaders uh, as well. Um, 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 what I wanted to uh, say uh, is NATO off the table. I think um, this is a very correct answer, a uh, qu correct question to ask, which is that um, why, you know, it's up to Ukraine to decide whether they want to apply or not, and it's up to the NATO countries to decide whom they accept or, or uh, whom th they don't. So if we already give in uh, to this, um, you know, threats by Russia, then, uh, I mean, we already give Russia the say uh, who, who gets to be where. And the last point I wanted to make, I, I, I just... Um, listening to all these discussions about Western Europeans, Eastern Europeans, I must say, um, you know, this makes me a, a bit uncomfortable because we are all Europeans, for God's sake. It doesn't matter where we come from, East or the West. Uh, we are in Europe. We share the same values. And, and, and we, we, you know, uh, are in this uh, um, together. So, of course, what I understood when I was member of the European Parliament uh, listening very carefully, all the histories of different European countries. You know, uh, they uh, were, you know, some countries have been suffering their, you know, uh, wounds. And, and you have to listen to others in order for them to understand your worries. So, so uh, this is extremely important to understand for, for all of us, yes. Okay. Yvonne, do you want? Thank you very much. Just to, first, I very much uh, agree on basically Zelensky effect in democratic politics in general. 
listen, all European societies after 1945, particularly in the West, have been following famous Bertolt Brecht, I feel pity for nations that do need heroes. So this was a post-sacrifice, post-heroic societies, and they were telling the story like this because they were afraid of their own previous kind of a nationalistic history. And then you have really a classical heroic president, and I do believe his famous statement, I'm here not for a right, but give me ammunition, was the turning point in this war. But listen, this is going to put, uh, and it's already changing the decision-making process very much. I was talking to a senior American officials. I said, under what conditions you can basically lift Russian uh, economic sanctions on Russia? He said, the only scenario which I see realistic is basically Zelensky going to the American Congress and ask for this. Mm. He said, I do not see any other scenario in which this can happen. Why I'm saying this, from this point of view, you have a certain type of a moral leadership which goes with Zelensky, and of course, you have other East European leaders who basically claim that they defeated Zelensky on the night of their elections. Why I'm saying this, Eastern Europe first, I mean, should try to basically come with a common view, not because of being East European, but exactly coming from a different tradition of viewing the world. Uh, 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 Milan Kundera has this famous se sentence saying that the biggest problem of East European countries is that they never can be sure that they're going to exist tomorrow. Yeah. They said, you cannot imagine that the in the French or in the German hymn, somebody is going to say, Polska nie zginała. So this type of an important sensitivity and sensibility, in my view, is very important for the European project because Eastern Europe has one advantage, and this is the intuition of the fragility of everything, including the uh, European project. But then you should try to open European unions for the problems of others, for basically issues in which normally we're not interested. By the way, talking to the younger generation in West European countries, which are very much about climate and things on which we're less interested, at least from where I'm coming from, not necessarily from the Baltic republics. Uh, and this is going to go for this uh, story why peace party and justice parties are not a right definition of what they represent. But believe me, there are going to be people who are going to say, for us, the only thing that matters is to stop the war as quickly as possible, regardless of the price that the Ukrainians are going to do. And in this peace coalition, you're going to have different forces. You're going to have pro-Russian forces. You're going to have people who are afraid of nuclear war. You're go this is not a kind of one and the same story. And then the Justice Party is exactly what Kai is saying, basically saying, do you really believe that they're going to be at peace? No. If, he, if he's going to occupy the territory of Ukraine, do you believe that this is not going to come back? But listen, this is not an easy conversation. My idea is in this room, we can easily agree on justice over peace. Go and talk to people who in six months are going to start to believe that there are things that are much more important than what is happening in Ukraine. Uh, I ask my colleagues to do a mathematical model how much time it takes for the German public opinion to stay on a high moral ground when it was the refugee crisis of 2015, which was very important for Germany. And the answer was 88 days. So for me, if you're really in a policy business from which people like Dan and Kaya are coming, the most important is to try to see what kind of a publics we're going to face in six months, in one year, in two years, and to be prepared to talk to these publics. Because in my view, this is about resilience. Resilience is to be able to sustain certain position over time. Dan. Well, David Kramer is right. There's no principled reason why Ukraine should not be considered for NATO membership if we're going to cons consider Finland and Sweden. What's the difference? And the difference is, hey, they were part of the Soviet Union and Putin really doesn't like it. Yuck. That's, that's a terrible argument. So in principle, you're right. As a practical matter, if we end up, I was at the Bucharest NATO summit in April 2008, so I know what it looks like when you go up against, you know, an immovable uh, objection at NATO. So therefore, you have to deal with the second best. But you're right. We should reassess, we should examine our own assumptions in light of this war, which leads to the larger question. We have to remember what it is we set out to achieve. 
The big American debate at the beginning of the 1990s was, <laughs> what did we fight the Cold War for? Was it simply to have a stable and predictable relationship with the Soviet Union? Or was it to liberate all of Europe? And that was a hard fought debate. And there were Republicans and Democrats on both sides of that issue. And it ended up that the Americans remembered that we, they remembered the, we remembered the Atlantic Charter, why we fought World War II. And all of this, the, the newly liberated Europeans said, yeah, that's right. That's right, about time you remembered us, what we fought for. And the best thing that happened in and after 1989 is that national patriotism in this part of the world generally, but not exclusively, crystallized in a democratic fashion. And it might have been otherwise. It was otherwise in the 1930s, and that's where Washington expected this part of the world to go, just back to tiresome nationalism. But no, no. You know, it turns out that the liberal spirit, which, you know, had right-wing and left-wing variants in this part of the world, won. It won out. Not forever, you know, not every country, not all the time. I get it, but crucially in when it counted. And in Ukraine, it's, you know, they're acting according to their better angels. I mean, my God. You know, the, the, a, a Jewish president of Ukraine is a wartime national hero. I mean, Khmelnytsky ought to get off the statue in central Kiev and apologize. <laughs> like, admit, okay, I was all wrong. <laughs> but my larger point is we have to remember what it is we set out to achieve. We all, and this goes for my own country uh, too, especially, we have the dark side. We have the dark side. And it's different in every country. And the challenge of that even Krost have mentioned, which is maintaining the political base for the kind of united Europe and the kind of free world that we want, that we seek, lies in the ability of political leaders to articulate that vision. I think, look, I think President Biden is trying. I think he and Ronald Reagan are representing left and right variants of the same good American tradition. Huh, there are other variants, left and right variants of our bad tradition. And it's every country's responsibility to step up and live up to that standard Zelensky has set. Look, as a peacetime president, he had many faults, right? Yeah. And now look at him. So, you know, take comfort from the good news and remember, you know, our own best principles and try to live accordingly. Thank you, Dan. I hope we have at least set out themes, questions, issues. We were never going to resolve them, uh, but you've been very patient. I'm sorry we didn't get more questions, but I just want to thank you and thank our panel for, a, to me, a wonderful opening session. Thank you very much.